नमस्कार दिस इज फर्स्ट पोस्ट इन वॉचिंग वैंटेज विद मी पलकी शर्मा Is China targeting Indian elections? Microsoft has issued a warning. It talks about how China is using technology to disrupt democracy, and the target list is not limited to India. So, what is China doing, and why is it dangerous? We'll bring you a special report tonight. Meanwhile, Google is in the news for exploring a new business model. Will you be charged for using their search engine? We'll tell you. The opposition Congress party in India has released its election manifesto. What promises are they making to voters? We have a list. In the Philippines, President Marcos Jr. is struggling with falling ratings, and China could be the answer to his woes. We'll explain. In Malaysia, in Malaysia, growing row over what's being called Allah socks. Critics say Islam has been insulted. In Pakistan, the generals are getting a taste of their own medicine. The Taliban is telling them to talk to terrorists. In Argentina, the president has fired some 15,000 government workers, and he's not done yet. Bird flu is spreading across continents. Experts fear it could be the next pandemic. Iran has vowed to quote unquote slap Israel. What does that mean? And why the world needs more women in tech? All this and more coming up. The headlines first. Israel fires the two military officers who ordered the strike, which killed foreign aid workers in Gaza. Israel claims it was targeting Hamas gunmen. When its military made a quote-unquote grave mistake, the incident has sparked an international outcry. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen warns China. says Beijing's industrial subsidies pose a big risk to the global economy Yellen cautions China that it is too large to export its way to rapid growth Yellen is the first top US official to visit China since President Biden met President Xi last November India's foreign exchange reserves hit an all-time high jumping to over 645 billion dollars after rising for the sixth straight week gold reserves have also increased to more than 52 billion dollars Zimbabwe launches a new gold-backed currency the Zig short for Zimbabwe gold will replace the Zimbabwean dollar which had lost almost 100% of its value the move aims to tackle sky high inflation and stabilize the economy Kosovo's main Serb party boycotts its first census in over a decade in February Kosovo banned the Serbian currency leading to tensions between Pristina and the country's ethnic Serbs Serbia does not recognize Kosovo's independence. And Apple joins the tech bloodbath, firing more than 600 people. It comes after the company shut down its car and smartwatch display projects. This is Apple's first big wave of post-pandemic job cuts. It's election season in India the politicians are busy campaigning and the poll officers are busy preparing after all we're talking about a mammoth exercise the biggest election in human history but guess who else is busy China the communist party of china is busy trying to meddle in india's elections says who Microsoft the company has released a comprehensive report it talks about China's illegal campaign how it's using an army of hackers how it's harnessing artificial intelligence and how it's showing sowing divisions ahead of elections and this is not limited to India Microsoft says China is targeting others too rivals like South Korea and the US and partners like Papua New Guinea so basically no one is spared we'll get to the modus operandi in a bit but first Who are these hackers? Well, China has an army of them. The FBI says Beijing has more hackers than all other major nations combined. Imagine that. We are talking about tens of thousands of them, and each hacking group has a target area. One of them is called Gingham Typhoon. They target the South Pacific region. Another group is Raspberry Typhoon. These guys carried out cyber attacks in Malaysia and Indonesia. Then you have Nylon Typhoon. Target South American nations like Brazil, Costa Rica and Peru. So it is pretty expansive. Now we come to the modus operandi. How are these Chinese hackers meddling in elections? You can divide it into three strategies. First, by using artificial intelligence. 
It could mean AI news anchors or AI voice notes or AI deepfakes. Most of these clones are being made using ByteDance, the same company that made TikTok. ByteDance has a tool called CapCut. It's a video and graphic platform powered by AI. You can use it to make AI anchors and these AI anchors will say anything you want. Just type in some fake news, then let technology do its magic. Look at one such China-backed AI anchor spreading fake news about India. The US and India are ambitious and use the conflict in northern Myanmar to secretly sell weapons for profit since the Myanmar military coup. The United States, the United Kingdom, Canada and other Western countries have imposed sanctions to curb the development of the Myanmar military government, which makes people surprised that India, a chess piece of the United States Asia Pacific strategy, has long provided weapons to the Myanmar military. Convincing? Maybe not. The quality is not really up to the mark, but the content is dangerous. India's northeastern states border Myanmar, so voters there are quite worried about the civil war. You have refugees fleeing to India. You also have ethnic fighters sneaking through. Imagine them seeing this video. It doesn't have to influence thousands of voters. Even one is unacceptable, we say. Which brings us to the second strategy that China has adopted. Making political memes and pictures. Again, AI plays a key role here. Look at these memes spread by Chinese cyber agents. All of them criticize the Fukushima water release. One of them has a picture of Godzilla on it. And look at the caption. It says, Japan is unleashing Godzilla, the embodiment of its nuclear trauma, into the world. Needless to say, that is not true. United Nations bodies have said that Japan's plan is fine. And yes, there is an election angle here. South Koreans will be voting for a new parliament this year and Fukushima is a key issue for them. It brings into question Seoul's handling of Japan, which is usually an important election issue there. Let me show you one more example. This one is about the wildfires in Hawaii. Chinese hackers claimed it wasn't a wildfire. They said it was a US met weapon test. Again, it's a false claim. These hackers used AI photos to push their fake news. Finally, they have the third strategy, posing as voters. And this is probably the most dangerous one because A, it's hard to detect and B, it's technically not even illegal. Let me show you some examples again. The first one is about the F-35 fighter jet crash last year. Look at what this social media account said, and I'm quoting, only under the Biden administration could the US military lose an $80 million F-35 jet. What do you think about this? Now look at the second one. Senators release a 118 billion package for Ukraine and Israel. It's a 75 billion handout to Ukraine and Israel. Only, and only 20 billion for our own border, what is your reaction? Now, do you see the problem here? Neither claim is fake news. An F-35 jet did crash last year and US senators did release the aid package. So this is what Chinese hackers are doing, picking polarizing political issues in the US, like the military budget or the border funding. They pose as US voters on social media and then they ask such open-ended questions. The idea is quite clear. Divide the country by tapping into polarizing topics. And it's a very dangerous strategy. The question is, what will be the impact of it? Well, Indian political campaigns have a large digital footprint. Around 700 million Indians use smartphones. More than 820 million Indians are active internet users. 820 million. Indian political parties also use a lot of social media. So theoretically, Chinese meddling could reach all of them. Which raises the bigger question, how do we protect our voters with more awareness and guidelines? The Election Commission will have to take the lead here. First, educate voters on deep fakes, teach them how to identify fake news and then partner with big tech firms. For example, Google has stopped its AI bot from talking about elections. It's a good step, but it's not enough. A lot more needs to be done. And finally, the traditional media will have to step up. I'm talking about TV channels and newspapers. The best way to fight disinformation is to provide the right information. So this is a battle that everyone must fight. Because this time, China is infiltrating India through the internet. It isn't targeting land or resources. China is targeting India's greatest asset. It's democracy.
Our second story is about Google. If the internet is a treasure chest of information, Google search is perhaps the key to unlock it. It is hard to imagine the internet without Google search. For countless people, the internet means Google. They cannot navigate the internet without it. And a big reason for that is this, Google search is free. But is that about to change? Will Google start charging you every time you look something up? I ask because Google is planning a major shakeup, perhaps the biggest one since the company came into existence. Google is toying with the idea of charging users for its services. It's not official yet, no plans have been announced formally, but reports say Google is working on paid services. Its coders are developing a new set of features, features that Google could put behind a paywall. They have not made up their mind yet, the top executives have not cleared the plan, and yet it's creating a lot of buzz because the very prospect is worth dwelling on. The fact that they're thinking along these lines, it would be a big shift for Google. And how would it work? Will you have to pull out your credit card every time you log on to Google for something? Look at the services that they offer for free. Gmail, Photos, YouTube, Chrome, Maps, Meets for online meetings, and Drive for online storage. All of these are available for free. Of course, many of them also have a paid version. Like you can pay to get more storage on Gmail. You can pay to get YouTube Premium. It doesn't show you ads. When you watch something on YouTube, you, you do not get ads, hence the premium fee. But these subscriptions are more like upgrades to existing services. They're offered to improve the user experience. Google never charges its users for access. Then how does it make money? By showing ads on Google search. It remains the company's biggest money churner. Last year, Google generated $175 billion through ads. This was more than 50%, 50% of Google's total sales through ads. So search is the biggest profit center for Google, then why start charging for it? Because there's a new disruptor in the game, it's called AI, artificial intelligence. Like most tech companies, Google is building AI features into its services, and that's what they plan to charge you for, the, the AI features. From what we understand, the traditional search engine will remain free and continue to be funded by advertising. But if you want AI to say skim through the results, and present a quick summary, you may be asked to pay for it. Google's AI chatbot is called Gemini. It is being pitted against OpenAI's ChatGPT. Now, Gemini is trying to catch up in the AI race, and Google is scrambling to install it in all its major services. So scaling up is proving to be a big challenge, because AI needs a lot more of computing resources. And for that, Google needs to spend a lot of money. Experts say making users pay for the AI service makes sense. There are three clear benefits for Google. One, it can scale up quickly. Two, recover some of the cost of investment. And three, keep its profit margins intact. That's the opinion from Bank of America. But will Google follow this path? It won't be an easy decision to make. Google going rather free from Going from free to paid will impact not just Google, but also a lot of its other users, like business owners who rely on Google to, to find customers, or websites that rely on Google for traffic. Plus, what happens to Google's advertising business? Will the company sacrifice its biggest cash cow as it makes a big bet on artificial intelligence? I guess they'll have to strike a balance. What they absolutely cannot do is sit out of the AI race. Artificial intelligence is the future of search. If Google can find the information that you need, AI can make it more relevant and useful. Searching on Google today, or any search engine, may feel like trying to find a needle in a haystack. You have to go through a long list of website links to find that one specific piece of information that you're looking for. But AI can speed up and optimize this process. It can find what you're looking for almost instantaneously. So it is crucial for Google to get its AI strategy right. Their future depends on it. This manifesto Congress Party has not made. This manifesto has made the people of India.
Back to India now. Another feature of every election is promises. Every party makes dozens of promises. X number of jobs, Y number of projects, billions in investments. We hear all kinds of tall promises. Parties also release a book of these promises. It's called a manifesto. Think of it as a to-do list for the government. Today, the main opposition, the Congress party, has released its manifesto. And they're calling it Nyay Patra, meaning document for justice. The whole thing is almost 50 pages long. It has 25 promises under five pillars of justice. That's what the Congress is calling them. But we're looking at the top 10 promises. Number one, a nationwide caste census. Basically, count the population based on caste. And how would that help? A lot of social schemes and benefits are linked to caste, but India's caste data is pretty old, almost 90 years old. So the Congress says we will conduct a new census and then social benefits will be distributed based on the new numbers. Promise number two, raising the quota limits. Right now, reservation based on caste cannot exceed 50%. Suppose a government course has 100 seats, then caste based quota cannot be more than 50. That's the rule. But the Congress is promising to raise that. How? using a constitutional amendment. Promise number three, the right to apprenticeship, the right to apprenticeship act. Suppose you're under 25 years of age, you also hold a diploma or a graduate degree, then you will be legally entitled to a one year apprenticeship. Both private and public firms will be roped in. The salary will be one lakh rupees per year, which is around $1,200. Promise number four, legally guaranteeing the minimum support price, the MSP. It's not a new concept. It's been around for decades. Every year, the government announces a floor price for 23 crops. This is the price at which the state buys from farmers. But in effect, they buy only two crops, wheat and rice. So some farmers say, legalize the MSP, make this annual practice a legal guarantee. Not just for wheat and rice, but for all 23 crops. Now we come to promise number five, raising the national minimum wage. Currently, it's around 176 rupees. The Congress is promising to raise it to 400 rupees a day. Promise number six, universal health care. We're talking about examination, diagnostics, treatment and surgery, all of this free at public hospitals. Promise number seven, filling up government job vacancies. Some three million sanctioned positions are lying vacant. The Congress says we will fill them up. Promise number eight, and now we come to the strategic stuff. Restoring statehood for Jammu and Kashmir. As you know, JNK used to be a state of the Indian Union, but it was turned into a union territory in 2019. The Congress says it will immediately restore statehood. The ruling BJP has also promised it, but they've not given a timeline. Promise number nine, cancelling the Agni Pat scheme. It was introduced by the current government in 2022. It's basically a recruitment program for the military. Here's how it works. Some 50,000 soldiers will be recruited every year. Only 25% of them will be commissioned. The rest will leave after four years of service. Now, the idea was to create a leaner fighting machine to reduce the pension bill. But many young Indians protested. So the Congress says this scheme will be cancelled if they come to power. And finally, promise number 10, foreign policy. A couple of things stand out here. First is on China. Listen to what it says. We will work to restore the status quo ante on our borders with China and to ensure that areas where both armies patrolled in the past are again accessible by soldiers. They don't say how. So the Congress is saying India has ceded land to China and it's, it is promising to reverse that. Another key point is about the neighborhood. The Congress says it will re-establish the primacy of India's relations with Nepal and Bhutan. It is also promising to repair relations with the Maldives. These are the top 10 Congress promises. There are some other interesting ones too, like legalizing same-sex unions and removing the state government in Manipur. So all in all, pretty comprehensive. Of course, manifestos are not legally binding. They simply indicate policy direction. More importantly, you have to win the election to do any of it. The BJP has criticized these promises. They say it's far removed from reality. We'll see the BJP's manifesto in the coming days, most likely. And that will make for an interesting comparison. Our next story is from the Philippines. It's about their president, Ferdinand Marcos Jr., who also goes by the nickname Bong Bong. He became president about two years ago, in June 2022. He has more than four years left in his term, but already his popularity is tanking. A new opinion poll is out. It says that this year, Marcos Jr.'s 
Junior's approval rating fell by 13%. It's down from 68 to 55, still over the halfway mark. Much better than the ratings for US President Joe Biden. Biden was hovering around 37% last month, but that's not really a benchmark, is it? So Bong Bong is in a bind. He has to govern for four more years, and he needs people behind him. So he has to shore up his approval ratings. How does he do that? Well, there are two ways, fixing domestic issues and smart foreign policy moves. The challenge for Marcos Jr. is domestic. His approval ratings have fallen for multiple reasons. He has failed to reduce inflation. The cost of living is still soaring. He promised one kilo of rice at 20 pesos. That's 35 cents in USD for one kg of rice. But he's failed to deliver so far. So the people of Philippines are upset, and that part is fair. But, but it's not his only problem. Marcos Jr.'s predecessor has been acting up, turning people against the current president. Listen to this. When I was the mayor, the Drug Enforcement Office showed me a list. Your name was there. But I don't want to expose you because you are a friend. We know each other. But you started. You entered into a conflict. Mr. President, you might follow the fate of your father. And what I was afraid of, it will divide the nation. It will be a bloody time. For those of you who may have forgotten, that is Rodrigo Duterte, the former president of the Philippines, the predecessor of Marcos Jr. and a friend turned foe. Duterte and Marcos Jr. were allies during the last election. Duterte's daughter, Sarah, is the current vice president. Yet, that was him calling Bong Bong a drug addict. And I should clarify, that's not why he got his nickname Bong Bong. But Duterte was doing his best to undermine the president. And it has worked. The biggest hit to Marcos, Marcos Jr.'s approval was in Mindanao. It's the big southern island in the Philippines and Duterte's home turf. Marcos Jr.'s approval rating fell by 22% in Mindanao. So he needs to do something fast or risk getting undermined by a supposed ally. And that is where foreign policy comes in. Next week, the president is going to Washington for a trilateral summit. It will be the US, the Philippines, and Japan. And what do you think they will talk about? China, of course. China is a pain for all these three countries, and no one is bearing the brunt like the Philippines. Every other week, you see videos like this, the Chinese Coast Guard attacking Philippine vessels. Beijing is trying to bully them, forcing them to retreat from disputed islands in the South China Sea, and then lecturing them to boot. The Rene Reef is part of China's Nansha Islands and is Chinese territory. The nature of the Rene Reef issue is that the Philippines attempts to invade and occupy China's territory. The current tense maritime situation is caused by the Philippines' constant provocations and the responsibility lies entirely with the Philippines. He's talking about the disputed second Thomas Shoal in the contested Spratly Islands. But you know China and its enthusiasm for renaming things. The islands are claimed by both countries. But instead of dialogue, China resorts to strong-arm tactics. This is a hot-button issue for the people of the Philippines that are tired of Beijing's bullying, so a president who stands up to China may get public approval. Marcos Jr. is trying to be that president. He hosted the U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, just a few weeks ago. He is visiting Washington next week. The message is clear. Marcos Jr. hopes the U.S. can help him thwart China. Beijing's bullying will be stopped by a bigger bully. And Marcos Jr. hopes this strategy will help him domestically as well. Reports say he's planning to upgrade military base, a military base in Mindanao, the southern island, and make it fit for joint operations with the U.S. That may help him one-up Duterte on his home turf as well, hitting two birds with one stone, securing domestic support and the South China Sea. Or perhaps we should say the West Philippine Sea. Our next story comes from Malaysia, where a major controversy has erupted. It features what's been called Allah socks, socks with the word Allah on them. They were being sold in Malaysia by a convenience store chain called KK Supermart. Needless to say, that this has sparked outrage. Some people believe the socks have insulted Islam, and they have responded with violence. Three outlets of KK Supermart have been attacked by petrol bombs. The owner of the store has apologized. 
but the tensions continue to rise. So much so that now Malaysia's Prime Minister has been dragged into the row. That's Anwar Ibrahim, now under pressure to restore order. Here's a report. These stores in Malaysia were attacked by an angry mob wielding petrol bombs. And it all happened because of a pair of socks. The controversy has now escalated. It's now threatening to consume the government of Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim. It all started with a few social media posts. They featured a photograph, bundles of socks bearing the word Allah on them. Allegedly, these socks were up for sale at three outlets of the KK Supermart. The photographs fanned public anger. Politicians called for a boycott of the stores. Among them was Akmal Saleh. He heads the youth wing of the UMNO, a political party that's part of the ruling coalition. Saleh's critics say that his statements fanned public anger and sparked the violent attacks on the stores. He's now being investigated for sedition, but the situation is far from contained. This week, Chai Ki Khan, the founder of the KK Supermart, met with the Malaysian king. He offered an apology. However, it failed to sway the king. Reports say the king told Chai Ki Khan that his business should have been more careful. How did the socks end up in his stores? Chai is blaming a Chinese supplier. His company received thousands of pairs. Chai claims when they found these socks, they pulled them from the shelves. Despite those efforts, 14 pairs still remained on sale at three outlets. Along with the public outrage, Chai faces a legal battle now. He has been accused of hurting religious feelings. In response, Chai has sued his Chinese supplier. Prime Minister Ibrahim has tried to defuse the situation. He issued a statement on Facebook. He asked all parties involved to take responsibility, but also warned them from taking advantage of the situation. But Ibrahim's appeal failed to move the needle. The Prime Minister's position is precarious. He relies on leaders like Akmal Saleh for support from the majority Malay Muslims. But his coalition is also backed by politicians who represent the ethnic Chinese. They are a minority community in Malaysia and they want the Prime Minister to restore peace. This puts Anwar Ibrahim on a collision course, with leaders like Akmal Saleh who has refused to back down or withdraw his call for a boycott of the KK Supermart. The situation is fragile. The police say they have stepped up patrols around all outlets of the KK Supermart. But they are yet to arrest any of the perpetrators who hurled the petrol bombs. The crisis presents a real challenge for Anwar Ibrahim and his government. It's the ultimate UNO reverse. The Afghan Taliban is advising Pakistan's government. Who thought this day would ever come? After all the financial support, after all the training, after all the diplomatic cover, the so-called proxy is dictating the puppet master. And what are they saying? Talk to the terrorists. We're talking about the TTP, the Tehreek-e Taliban Pakistan, or simply the Pakistan Taliban. Their stated goal is to overthrow the current Pakistani regime. And then create a hardline Sharia state in its place, in Pakistan. Basically create an Afghanistan in Pakistan. Now this group is bleeding Islamabad. Some 1,000 civilians died in terror attacks last year. A lot of them were carried out by the TTP, so it's a sworn enemy of the Pakistani state. And what does Kabul say? Why don't you talk to them and sort it out? The comments came from the Taliban's deputy interior minister. In fact, let me quote from what he said. We asked the government of Pakistan and advised the brothers who are fighting with them to come together and talk. These wars and revolutions leave behind widows and orphans. A bit rich, I would say. More than 1,000 civilians have died since the Taliban took power. Did they not leave behind widows and orphans? But that's a story for another day. For now, let's focus on Pakistan. This statement is a very important one. You see, both Talibans share close ethnic ties. They're mostly made up of Pashtun fighters. Some of them have familial links. So Pakistan thought Kabul will help to crack down on the TTP, maybe knock some sense into them. But the Afghan Taliban is doing the opposite. They say, it's not our fight. So talk to each other and sort it out. It's the first public statement of the Taliban's position. 
Until now, there was confusion around it. But now it's pretty clear the Afghan Taliban will not help contain the TTP. Which brings us to Islamabad. Will they take the Taliban's advice? The foreign ministry says no. They will not talk to the Pakistani Taliban. It's actually a strategy that they've tried before. In 2021, former Prime Minister Imran Khan initiated talks. At first, there was no success. But the next year, a ceasefire deal was signed. It lasted for a couple of months. Then, in November 2022, the TTP called it off. They began launching attacks again. And since then, it's been relentless. There has been a 93% rise in attacks since the deal was called off. Many experts say it was, in fact, a trap. The TTP used the ceasefire deal to regroup and plan and once they regain their power they resumed attacks so simply put they played pakistan does any of this sound familiar to you terrorists supported by a neighbor that neighbor downplaying the threat and ceasefire deals being violated it's what pakistan has done to other countries especially india now they're getting a taste of their own medicine but what can pakistan do to solve this problem They've already ruled out talks. So is the army going to launch a full-scale operation, a crackdown to flush out the TTP? Not without, without foreign support. We've seen Pakistan trying to rally global opinion. First, they complained about the TTP at the United Nations Security Council. Then they talked to the Americans. And now they're reaching out to Saudi Arabia. Prime Minister Shabazz Sharif is visiting the kingdom this weekend. It will be his first foreign trip after taking office. But will any of it actually work? At this point, Islamabad may not have an option. If they sign a peace deal with the TTP, they will have to make concessions. We're talking about embarrassing concessions, like releasing TTP terrorists from jail and granting more autonomy in border areas. These are places where the TTP fighters are based. So Pakistan has a tough choice to make. Do they risk a bloody and grinding military operation or do they hope for a diplomatic settlement? Whatever they choose, let's hope Islamabad learns the most important lesson. Terror is terror. There is no such thing as good terrorists. Our next story is about bird flu. From Antarctica to America, it's spreading everywhere. In the South Pole, thousands of penguins are dead. In America, thousands of cattle are infected. And not just that, even humans are affected now. A man in Texas has been infected with the virus. It was after he came in touch with sick cows. Does that mean the virus could spread to more humans? America's top disease control body says no. That's the CDC. It believes the rate of transmission to humans is still low, but scientists are urging caution. Could bird flu become the next pandemic? Our next report tells you. Antarctica, it's one of the harshest environments on Earth. Yet, in this pristine wilderness, life continues to flourish. But that life is now facing a hidden threat, the H5N1 virus, commonly known as the bird flu virus. It reached the region last year, and since then, it has been killing the wildlife there. The biggest victim are penguins. Last month, a scientific exploration found at least 532 dead Adelie penguins. Many of them were frozen solid. Others were covered in snow. While the team couldn't tally all the carcasses, they believe thousands more could be dead. The scientific community is worried about big risks because there are species in danger of extinction, such as emperor penguins and other birds. Also, it is because of the crowded behavior of penguins when they form reproductive colonies. This may promote and increase the disease transmission rate among various bird colonies. But it's not just Antarctica that's affected. Avian influenza is sweeping the United States. The first cases emerged in 2021. It was detected in wild migratory birds. Soon it spread to poultry farms. In 2023, the US went through its worst outbreak of the bird flu. Now it's spreading to other mammals like dairy cows. It has infected herds of cows across the state. But the problem is not just limited to cows. A person has tested positive for bird flu. This was in the state of Texas. He is said to have come in contact with sick cows. Which brings us to the question, should you be worried? First, let's take a look at the H5N1 virus. It was first reported in China in 1996. 
It's a type of influenza virus, one that causes severe respiratory diseases in birds. But the virus is occasionally known to spread to humans as well. Symptoms include mild illnesses, eye redness to severe pneumonia. Human infections with H5N1 were first reported in 1997. This was during a poultry outbreak in Hong Kong. So does that make it a risk to humans? 873 humans have been infected with H5N1 avian flu in 20 years. 458 have died. That's a fatality rate of more than 50%. India reported its first case and death due to H5N1 in 2021. So can it cause the next pandemic? For now, avian influenza is not on the WHO's priority list. It's not part of pathogens with pandemic potential. The CDC, or Centers for Disease Control and Prevention too, say the risk remains low. So the, the risk to most, most people is very, very low. It's important to remember that individuals who are interacting with livestock or other animals that have avian influenza, really it's important to connect to public health and medical care to make sure that you're being observed. But again, for most people, if you're not exposed to these animals, um, the risk is, is very, very low. But scientists have called for more tests. The need of the hour is containing the spread. More people need to be tested, more animals need to be vaccinated, and interaction with infected animals should be monitored. One case may not be enough to trigger a pandemic, but it's better to be safe than sorry. For our next story, let's talk about government jobs. Here in India, a government job is sacred. Millions study for it, thousands crack it. It's an assured path to a better life, or so people think. A safe and secure future. But in Argentina, government jobs are under attack. It's part of Millenomics, President Javier Millet's economic plan for Argentina. Millet took office in December 2023. At that time, the state employed around 341,000 people. 3,41,000 government employees. Millet did not like that. He vowed to cut down the numbers. And since then, he's been walking the talk. By March, he'd fired some 9,000 people. This week, new layoffs were announced. Argentina has cut 15,000 more jobs. Government jobs, 15,000. So a total of 24,000 people have been fired in the government. If you thought President Millet campaigning with the chainsaw was bad, he's now slicing the government. And he's far from done. He wants to cut more jobs. How many? Approximately 70,000. It's left workers in a state of limbo. Many are calling it a state of psychological terror. They, don't, they do not know who is next. Temporary workers are living in fear. People are out on the streets protesting. We received an email informing us that they weren't renewing our contracts and that they won't pay compensation. For this reason, we are today at the door and we're calling to collectively get in. We will organize an assembly because we don't want any of us to end up in the street. There are enough reasons so that the three central unions discuss a national strike and demand a change to this government. So which are the worst affected industries? It seems like a bloodbath across the board. The ministry is, ministries of Economy, Energy and Social Security, the National Institute Against Discrimination, they've all got layoff notices and many more will in the coming days. And this should not be surprising for Argentinians. This is exactly what Millet campaigned on and this is also what Argentina voted for. Their president describes himself as an anarcho-capitalist. He believes in a free market and he has promised to go to any lengths to achieve it. His first target is the state bureaucracy. Millet wants to remove temporary workers, cancel state contracts and reduce ministries by half, effectively chopping down the size of the state. He says this workforce does not match with Argentina's economy. And he has a point. Let me show you the survey from 2023. It looks at the ratio of state workers to the number of employed people. Topping the list are developed countries, the likes of Norway, Sweden, Denmark. They have a lot of people employed by the government compared to people employed elsewhere. A very high number of government employees. And where does Argentina figure in this list? Number seven. So government hirings are high, the seventh highest in the world. But that does not translate into effectiveness. Here's the World Bank Index from 2022. It rates government effectiveness. Argentina has a score of 41.9 out of 100. So it's not very effective. The government may employ lots of people, but when it comes to work, it's not very good. And that's what Millet wants to target. 
His enemy number one are gnocchis. Disclaimer, he is not waging a battle against the pasta. In Argentina, gnocchi stands for fictitious government workers. They get their government jobs from political parties. So they don't have to do a lot of work. They usually go to office only once a month to collect their salary. And why are they called that? Because in Argentina, gnocchi is served, often served on the 29th of the month, which also happens to be their payday. That's the name gnocchi. Now, Millet wants to eliminate them and make the system more lean. Hence, the multiple rounds of layoffs. But Millet is treading a fine line here. He may want to cut costs, but layoffs could trigger social unrest. In fact, they already have. Argentina's economy is struggling. The peso has collapsed. Consumption is low, which means the labor market is bad. Companies are no longer hiring people. And in the middle of all of this, the president's layoffs have left thousands of people jobless. Many fired workers have refused to quit, though. They say they will show up for work. Argentina's trade unions are also up in arms. They've organized a mass strike. So this will be an uphill challenge for the president. In trying to save the economy, he may plunge the country into chaos. And now let's talk about Israel. The country has come under fire from all sides, friends and foes. Foe here means Iran, primarily. On Monday, the Iranian embassy complex in Syria was attacked. Iran blames Israel for the attack. Their supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, has vowed revenge. He says Israel will be, quote-unquote, slapped, whatever that means. But more than Iran, Israel might be worried about its allies. Israel attacked an aid convoy on Monday night on purpose. It killed seven aid workers from the charity called World Central Kitchen. They were distributing food to starving people in Gaza and this has caused an uproar in the West. The United Nations has called it a potential war crime. But the biggest pressure is coming from the US where Joe Biden has finally issued an ultimatum. Here's our report. Sunday will mark six months of the war on Gaza. Six months since Hamas attacked Israel and the retaliation that has followed. Over 33,000 Palestinians are dead. Hamas still holds about 100 hostages. A ceasefire is nowhere in sight. And Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu seems no closer to his aim of eradicating Hamas. With no tangible gains to show, Netanyahu seems to be going the other way angering friends and foes alike with his indiscriminate attacks. Monday was an especially chaotic day. The Iranian embassy in Syria's capital, Damascus, was bombed. Twelve people were killed, including two Iranian generals. Iran believes Israel is responsible. Israel has not claimed responsibility yet, but this was Netanyahu on Thursday. For years, Iran has been working against us directly and through its proxies. And therefore, Israel is working against Iran and its proxies, both defensively and offensively. We will know how to defend ourselves and we will act according to the simple principle that whoever hurts us or plans to hurt us, we will hurt them. Not a direct admission of guilt, but pretty close. This failure of the Israeli regime in Gaza will definitely continue, as well as these desperate efforts like what they did in Syria. Of course, they will be slapped for this action. That is Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, Iran's supreme leader. He has received the remains of his generals. He personally led a prayer for them today. The Ayatollah has vowed revenge. What could that mean? The CIA reportedly thinks an Iranian attack is imminent. Yesterday, it had warned Israel of an attack within 48 hours, which is why this is the worst time for Israel to have angered its friends as well. Monday wasn't just the day of the embassy strike. That's also when foreign aid workers in Gaza were killed by Israel. Seven people working for a charity called World Central Kitchen, a charity founded by celebrity chef Jose Andres. This is what he had to say. Well, uh, at the end is what we know, what everybody knows, uh, that seven team members between the special uh, specialty security people we have, three British individuals and three uh, three international crew plus one Palestinian, that they were targeted systematically, car by car. He says Israel systematically targeted the aid workers. It wasn't an accident. 
So the West is outraged. I spoke uh, to President Biden yesterday. President Biden made a statement, which seems is already uh, a harder stand. Biden has finally taken a harder stand. He called Netanyahu yesterday and issued an ultimatum. Reduce civilian casualties or lose American aid. It may not sound like much of an ultimatum, but it seems to be working. Israel is opening up more border crossings. It is also going to allow more aid into Gaza to provide food to the starving civilians there. It's not the end of the war, but it's something. Biden and the West have finally wrapped Netanyahu on the knuckles, so he's backing down for now. But will this be a turning point, or will things go back to how they were after public attention fades? Industry 4.0, that's what many are calling the fourth industrial revolution. And we're already living through it. The manufacturing sector is being digitized, driven by disruptive trends. Technology is moving at lightning speed. And with that, the job market is being left to play catch up. The way we work is evolving rapidly. Jobs are changing, some degrees are losing their value and others are soaring in demand. For instance, those in the field of STEM, that's science, technology, engineering and math, S-T-E-M, STEM. Over the last decade, opportunities in the STEM field have grown dramatically. STEM is being called the future of work. Moving forward, future jobs will require twice as much science, maths and critical thinking than they do today. And 90% of jobs in tech will require STEM skills. We know this. But are we keeping up? It depends on who you ask. Women comprise nearly half the global workforce, yet they hold only 28% of STEM-related positions. Globally, only 20% of engineering graduates are women. It is even worse for women of color. They comprise less than 2% of this group. These statistics are terrible. Now, some countries are trying to make a difference here, like Singapore. It is encouraging more women to study STEM. Singapore wants its women to pursue more jobs in the field. And why is that? To reduce the gender pay gap. Today, it stands at about 14% in the country, the pay gap. With more women in tech, the pay gap is bound to reduce. But Singapore is hardly the only one making this push. Japan is another example. It is trying to turn women into the next engines for economic growth. It is eliminating barriers for women in STEM. According to research, this could accelerate productivity by 20%. Meanwhile, 26 European Union nations have signed a declaration to ensure that women play a prominent role in technology. And it has helped. Now, most EU countries, including Germany, France and Denmark, are seeing an increase of women's participation. Poland has the highest percentage of female STEM graduates in the world, followed by the UK. In the past few years, India, Australia and the US have also introduced similar programs. And this makes sense. We are living in extraordinary times. Technology is at the forefront of everything that we do. If women lag behind, so will a nation's talent pool. The goal is to increase the number of women studying information technology so more women join the workforce and hopefully more women are able to climb to the top. Because right now the situation is dire. Globally, women in tech comprise about 24% of leadership roles, less than one-fourth. Let alone the real world, even in the metaverse, women are locked out. Metaverse is a virtual world. This technology is still in its early stages. It is said to be the big thing of tomorrow. In the organizations shaping the standards for metaverse, basically big tech companies like Meta, Apple and Microsoft, 90%, 90% leadership roles are held by men. So the future looks even more bleak. Hopefully, the world steps up before this prediction becomes a reality. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. In the UK, Rishi Sunak's setbacks have spilled from the electoral field to the cricket field. He was bowled out by a child during a photo op. In Turkey, a train made out of plastic barrels gives disabled dogs their daily walks. And it's not just the Gaza war that's shaking up the UN Security Council. An earthquake shook the body this morning during a briefing. Finally, we're taking you back in history on this day in 1879. Chile declared war on Peru and Bolivia. It was known as 
the War of the Pacific. The war was about control of mineral deposits in the Atacama Desert. Chile ended up winning the war. We are leaving you on that note. Thanks for watching. Have a great weekend. sanitation to speak of. A community I visited had one toilet for 600 people. Women stood in line for three hours to make use of it. Schools normally form a spine of protection for children, a place where children can seek humanitarian services and normality. Go ahead. Education is Education is... You're, you're making the ground shake. <laughs> <laughs> Education is, in many ways... Madam President, am I okay to continue? Education is, in many ways, life-saving. But not in Gaza, where every single child is out of school and 80% of education facilities have been destroyed. Mm -hmm. The German clock may have struck midnight, but the nation simply declared it 4.20. If you know what we mean, because on Monday the green wave took over Germany. Now this beer land has become more cannabis friendly. It has partly decriminalized marijuana use. What does this mean? Germany has legalized possession of small amounts of cannabis for recreational use. Adults are allowed to carry up to 25 grams of dried cannabis. They can cultivate up to three marijuana plants at home. And July 1 onwards, adults who don't want to grow their own plants can be allowed to join the so-called cannabis clubs. The clubs can grow and distribute the drug, but on a strictly not-for-profit basis. Each club can have up to 500 members. As for the members, they can only be part of one club. They will have to pay a membership fees, after which they will be allowed to buy 25 grams of marijuana per day or a maximum of 50 grams per month. This figure is limited to 30 grams for people under the age of 21. So there are a lot of layers here. But the German cannabis campaigners are rolling with it, and happily so. They celebrated the newly liberalized law with a smoke-in. That's what they called it. It was held at Berlin's Brandenburg Gate. People danced, played music, joined hands in lighting up celebratory joints and filled the air above with a cloud of smoke. One attendee's sign interestingly said, we don't want to be criminals and largely that is the sentiment. It is socially discredited, but I mean alcohol and many other things are somehow normal and commonplace and I think it's better to deal with such topics openly. 
if you really go into education instead of criminalization and that's the right way to go now i think you can definitely bring awareness to it because no matter what kind of consumption it is alcohol marijuana and maybe other things too and the government agrees berlin's shift comes amid a growing trend in europe over the past 20 years member nations are hashing out the legalization of cannabis malta spearheaded the shift it also has among the blocks most open laws It allows adults to carry up to 7 grams. Luxembourg last year began allowing residents to cultivate cannabis for personal use. Now Germany is the third European country to join the club. But even nations that aren't legalizing the drug have been reducing penalties against it, including making possession a civil offense, diverting offenders to treatment instead of the criminal justice system or less strict enforcement. For instance, the Netherlands may have a reputation for being relaxed on marijuana, but it is still illegal to possess or sell the drug there. Even so, the Dutch have a policy of so-called toleration. The coffee shops can sell small quantities of the drug. Question remains, why is this shift happening? According to the German government, legalization would undermine criminal trade in the drug. It would maintain quality control and guard against harmful impurities. it would free up the police so they can pursue more serious crimes on top of this both the government and supporters claim that it will help kill the black market we will definitely push back the black market not overnight we won't manage that but if you look at it over a medium term period about 4 or 5 years i'm definitely convinced that our social clubs can help to ensure the protection of minors to provide people with clean uncontaminated products where people are no longer criminalized for what they do And the biggest argument of them all, millions of people are smoking marijuana anyway. So why not decriminalize it with guardrails? The cannabis policy of the last 10 years has failed. We have seen a doubling of consumption, especially among children and adolescents, among young adults. Youth protection is not working. The black market is getting bigger and bigger. The number of drug-related deaths has doubled in the last 10 years. It could not go on like this. and that may be but does it mean decriminalizing the drug is the right path according to many not really doctors police and many experts have strongly objected to germany's recent move they are warning of grave real world harm police unions claim demand will quickly outstrip legal supply so criminal networks will adapt they will quote unquote infiltrate the social clubs and enforcing the law then will be a quote unquote mammoth task for the police forces they are also pointing to traffic risks from stone drivers doctors have several concerns as well cannabis can be addictive it can adversely affect mental health the new policy makes its access much easier and so its image will become even more normalized and it won't be long before many underage germans gain access to the drug In 2021, much before the decriminalization, 10% of them already were. There is also evidence that in states where cannabis has been legalized, usage of the drug among adults has increased. Studies also say that marijuana use is likely to precede use of other illicit and illicit substances. There is another argument here. Experts claim that if the main goal is to kill the black market, there is a good chance it won't be achieved. because so far no approach has existed to truly shut down the cannabis black market including its legalization so there is an array of problems here but that doesn't matter all that much it seems because nation after nation is turning a new marijuana leaf and rushing towards the green rush